My name is uh, Benjamin Kim Ozer. I was born in Mapugu, Seoul in 1984, which would make me uh, 37 years old, 37 years young, uh, if you will. And I came to Stateside when I was three months old to a very loving family in central New Jersey. So my origin story is, is a little bit more complex now that I'm uh, more of an adult and I had the opportunity to go back and visit Korea as part of my um, teaching English and Korea experience. Um, and in no purposeful way did I actually mean to do a birth search. Um, part of it was wanting to find just medical records and, and know a little bit more about my you know, my health status, because I get that, you know, that question all the time um, from doctors. My father was actually looking for me. So my birth father was actually looking for me. And so my file uh, was at the top of the deck, if you will. And so when I called the adoption agency, they said, hold on a second. And it turned out that because my file was at the top, they knew my case number relatively um, closely. And so they're like, your dad was actually in here are you interested in meeting him at all? And so I was hesitant at first, but then I think uh, really excited about the prospect of being able to meet your birth father. So I sent him a letter and very quick, two weeks later, we were able to find a time to meet and uh, you know have, a, have an experience. So in meeting my birth father, he came with actually his sister, and so who I would call my Como. And it was unexpected, unexpected in the sense that I didn't have an understanding of what it would be like to be in an office space room and, have, and be able to walk and enter a room and have your birth father and your aunt there uh, to welcome you. And so it was... Uh, a little bit nerve-wracking. I was a little bit anxious, but I think based on my like personality and my characteristics, like very uh, close to the vest or did not show a lot of emotion. Um, and I'm not sure. And I've been told like it could be a Korean thing, but uh, you know, definitely not showing a lot of emotion. But was, but beyond just that that initial meeting, we ended up making an entire day out of it. Um, and so we were able to go to lunch um, with him and my Como, and then my translator and then actually spent the entire day together and so it was very emotional it was it was a long but emotional day and 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 conversation was the hardest because there's a lot of things you want to ask but you want to ask appropriately and you want to ask in a frame of you know that doesn't offend anyone but doesn't you know is able to answer questions and one of the hardest questions is like you know why right why were why was I relinquished, you know, for adoption? And, and I think it was difficult, you know, at first for him to kind of give more of the details, but as the day uh, progressed, you were able to ask some more refining questions to, to get a few more details about, you know, why I was relinquished for adoption. But by the end, you know, by the end, it felt very, you know, you felt very close. You felt like a, a missing piece of who you are has been identified. Not necessarily that it's an instant, love or connection but there was a piece that you know a piece that had come together for you just to close a gap in terms of oh now i know what i'm gonna look like when i'm 65 right now you know now some things that hey there is some connection to the korean community that is more than just social right and and i do have a large extended family back in korea but the hardest part of that day specifically was leaving Leaving was the hardest thing uh, to do. I couldn't control my emotions because in my mind, I think it was like, oh, you're leaving again, right? So I, you know, my, my um, translator and I hopped onto the train and I just could not stop crying, you know? And I don't know what, it, like, what had come over me. My coma was, was burst into tears and, and she was crying too. So I don't know if it was reactionary or just that sub, you know, subconscious feeling of it's happening all over again. So I would say that was the, that was the hardest part of the day. Like I kind of uncontrollable, uncontrollable tears. I'm not sure if it, if if the emotion was joy or the emotion was grief. It was confusion. I think for me it was definitely confusion. I think reliving it in a frame in a in a you know at the time I was 25 years old versus when I was, you know, when I left when I was three months old, it, it's a completely different experience. And now that I had the capacity to 
think critically about it, right, and actually be in my own emotions about it was uh, confusing. The catch-up is the, the hardest part. And I think what became really difficult for me um, at a point in our relationship was that he felt like I was ready to just return. You know, thankful for my adoptive parents who have raised me into the man of, you know, who I am today, but, you know, their job is done. And to return to the family and just immediately, like, assimilate and transition back to a life in Korea. So he was definitely pushing the idea that to come back and, and not think otherwise about it. And so it was very challenging to navigate the respect and, and feelings feelings for him, but also my own personal feelings for my life here in America, uh, my adoptive parents, who I, you know, I'll call my parents from here on out. But the idea of realism for him wasn't, we didn't match, you know, it didn't, it did not, we weren't on the same page to say the least, yeah. So to, to my understanding, you know, in terms of my backstory about adoption, you know, to be a male and to be relinquished for adoption was like a little bit more um, rare versus women at the time, right? Because in, in, you know, from what my understanding of Korean, you know, culture and heritage is that men bring on, you know, carry the family name and, and really have, you know, a position or, or honor as far as their status in Korea. That being said, um, I did find out from my birth father that I was the firstborn of the ki of the kids he would later have, and of course, of the kids my my birth mother would later have. But uh, yeah, it was it, I was really excited about that experience with my father, and so it, it piqued my interest to do the same thing with my mother. I did end up writing a letter. They did have her information on file at the at the agency, and um, but her response was a little bit more of reluctancy and hesitation. So it took a little bit more convincing um, for her to set up a, a moment to meet with me. Um, but it did end up happening and I think it was a really good experience. Um, but I could I could get a sense that it was always like to a degree of separation. You know, she was, she was authentic, but up to a point. I think there was a lot of guilt um, and a lot of uncertainty for her because she hadn't told her current husband uh, that I existed, um, and and I was the the secret or just the un you know the untold story um, as part of her continued you know relationship with with her current husband. I think for me, if I had to interpret his desire to meet me, it was just pure curiosity. You know, I, the, one of the first things I remember him saying, like when we met, was just like, oh. You know, like strong, tall, handsome guy, right? So uh, I think he was very proud of that. You know that I that I turned out the way I did, and without his, you know, without his guidance or without his help, and you know, to bring that back into the to the Kim family name, I think was really important for him. His potential thoughts for for not having you know ownership or responsibility of the experience. Um, in terms of my upbringing, uh, was frustrating, but also, like I said, challenging, um, because my parents had done so much work, you know, raising me, loving me, and and providing a, a safe space. And then I get to Korea, you know, when I'm 24, and go, oh, it's all over. You know, you can you can come back now. You're you know you're one of us. Come live here for the rest of your life. And that was one of the things when I talk about being stubborn. That's one of the things that that make it so challenging, right? He has such a belief that I need to return and I need to, you know, take my place, but I didn't, I didn't, we did not see eye to eye on that, right? I have a very loving and caring family at home. My Korean was still not that great. So, you know, challenge city, yeah. I, w I don't know if I could articulate that my life was complete. I, I think there, there are parts that, ha that have come, you know, with closure, but will always be kind of the the last door on the block or the last door in, in the hallway. But I don't, but at the same time, closure, closure looks different in so many different capacities. And where I was when I was 26 and leaving Korea and where I am now, 37, you know, can I come to peace with it? Probably, maybe, I'm not sure. I would like to return, I would like to see them. But I think in, in the same way, they're always like one degree at a distance. 
you know, they've lived their lives without me and I've had to accept that I've lived their lives, you know, my life without them, so. My adoptive uh, parents and, and family were, were very reluctant. I think for them, and, and true, true, to, true to word, right, they were very reluctant um, that I would find my birth parents through this process and leave them. I think they were very fearful that I would just drop everything and, you know, reassimilate and reintegrate in, into a traditional Korean family. I would, at the time, Skype, right? I would Skype my parents and we would have our weekly conversations and they'd be very anxious. Like, they would ask and be support, you know, be as supportive as they could, like how to go and, and stuff like that. Are you still talking to them as, as we continue to progress? But you could tell my mom, is, you know, especially was really, was really fearful that I would just up and leave them. They mean a ton to me, right? They're incredibly special to me. Um, and, and I give my time and experience in Korea a lot of credit to understand some of those Korean values in terms of respecting elders. And that has only made me have a greater appreciation for them and everything they were able to give and provide to me uh, growing up. And so I could never abandon them. I believe my time in, in Korea really helped to solidify and shape my identity as, as a member of the Korean community. Uh, prior to going to Korea, you know, I hadn't had a lot of experiences um, with Korean communities, you know, growing up in central New Jersey and going to an undergraduate that was, you know, predominantly white in the middle of Connecticut does not support that cultural exploration, but I was okay with it at the point, right? And that's part of, that's part of growth and maturity. But when you move to a place like New York City, when you're finally exposed to a number of different diversities and, and cultures, um, it started to pique my interest and started just to open the door. I also took some um, classes based in understanding identity and identity formation through the human lifespan. So that started to also push me in, in knowing where my where I fit. I, I knew I was Korean, but I, I didn't feel like I fit in the community um, of Koreans and, and what communities did exist when growing up were very small. And so still felt like an outsider, um, but I finally started to make and build a network of peers and friends um, in the Asian community. And so did I necessarily feel like I was super Korean? No, but I started to feel more Asian, right? And I started to feel a little bit more authentic and a little bit more welcomed, but still always not quite good enough. And um, I was very fortunate at least to have that network that introduced me to K-Town in Korea. It was a lot of late nights in, in K-Town for sure, but even being like a, a fly on the wall or even being like a, you know, being introduced to these places was really powerful. And I can remember vividly, like, some of the Korean friends that I had made um, at school, I would be so jealous when they would speak in Korean and order in Korean. And I was just, I'd be like, dude, keep doing it, right? Like, keep, keep, keep ordering, because it was so fascinating to me. I'm the, you know, practically this, this white kid from, uh, you know, Connecticut at that point, uh, living in the big city, but I loved it. I thought it was super cool and super authentic to hear it and to see it, see the interactions between you know, service workers, our friends. And I think that was the, the snowball effect and that continued my interest and exploration in how I fit into the Korean community. My origin story with, with camp uh, dates back to the, to the 90s. I was very fortunate that my parents pushed me into an adoptee camp um, as a young person that was, a, that was affiliated with my adoption agency, Holt. And so I attended Holt camp here in New Jersey for several years and was surrounded by, at the time, many Korean adoptees. And it was an incredible experience because you're finally in a space for the first time as a young person where no one asks a lot of questions, like a lot of the same questions because you're all in the same experience, right? You're all in the same boat. Um, so that was really impactful for me. And I had an incredible experience as a counselor being able to connect and give back. Some of my authentic experience having lived in Korea, but also my experience as an adoptee um, in 2012 and then I continued on and, and leadership started to transition and change and I was asked to to help lead it in conjunction with Joy and, and having the experience to have kids fully mature and develop over the course of several years and especially when I get to witness it uh, has been incredibly powerful and meaningful for, me, meaningful for me. I think if I can have the influence of, you know, on one person that ultimately can have the conversation or 
create a program or organization or tool or resource for others, then I'm, li you know, I'm living my best life, right? I'm, I'm feeling successful and I'm feeling like they, they can count on that experience to help drive their confidence or, or their ability to influence identity. I'm Benjamin Kim Ozer, and this is my Korean American story. Thank you.